In my previous video, I grew oxide layers on silicon wafers. Today, I'm going to show how to remove these oxide layers using readily available chemicals. This video features hazardous chemicals and is for educational purposes only. Proper training, equipment, and safety precautions are needed to handle these chemicals safely. Do your own research and consult with experts before attempting anything in this video. If you choose to handle these chemicals yourself, you are doing so at your own risk. The process of removing oxide layers on silicon is called etching. Etching oxide layers is an indispensable part of the fabrication process when making silicon devices. This is true for two main reasons. In an integrated circuit, silicon dioxide is used as an insulator between the devices in the semiconductor layer and the metal wiring on top. In order to connect the wires to the semiconductor devices, we need to etch away specific parts of the oxide layer, allowing the metal to make a direct connection to the devices below. Making the semiconductor devices themselves also requires etching. You start by adding an oxide layer on silicon, then you etch holes in the oxide. The oxide acts as a mask, or stencil, which allows you to add precise amounts of impurity atoms to specific locations on the silicon surface. This process happens at high temperatures, so whatever mask we use needs to be extremely heat resistant. Fortunately, silicon dioxide is perfect for the job. It's easy to grow, its melting point is 1600 degrees Celsius, and it's very chemically stable. So whatever impurity atoms you're using won't react with and consume the mask layer. There's just one problem. In order for this mask to work, we need to be able to make holes in the mask layer. There are two main ways we could accomplish this task. Physical etching or chemical etching. Physical etching involves cutting or chipping away at the oxide layer. This method, while possible, is not easy to accomplish. Remember that the oxide layer is only a few hundred nanometers thick so removing the material with some kind of cutting tool is not really feasible. The standard method used in industry involves ionizing atoms in a vacuum chamber, accelerating them to high speeds, and using them to bombard the surface of the chip. The heavy ions strike the silicon with enough speed to break atoms off the surface. As you might imagine, the cost of such equipment makes this method unsuitable for a home lab. A far easier and cheaper way to make holes in the oxide layer is by using a chemical etching process. We grow the oxide as before, and then add a mask layer over that, usually photoresist. We then remove part of the mask layer, and then immerse the entire wafer in a chemical etching solution. The chemical etch eats away the part of the oxide that is unprotected by the mask layer. The etching chemical is then rinsed away, and the mask layer is removed. This leaves us with a precise hole in the oxide layer. Easy enough. So what do we need for this process? Well, all we really need is a chemical that will react with and dissolve the oxide layer. That can't be too hard to find, right? Well, as I mentioned earlier, silicon dioxide, or glass, is very chemically stable. You know how when you picture a chemistry experiment, your mind fills with images of different flasks and tubes and apparatuses? Well, those are all made of glass for a reason. Glass is either resistant to or outright immune to pretty much any chemical you're likely to encounter. Here is a list showing the chemical resistance of glass. R means resistant, and NR means not resistant. As you can see, glass is resistant to basically every chemical. There is one notable exception, however. Hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid, commonly called HF, is an extremely useful chemical in the petroleum industry, as well as countless others. Hydrofluoric acid is pretty much our only option for etching silicon dioxide layers in order to make masks for our wafers. There is just one problem. Hydrofluoric acid is widely considered one of the most dangerous acids in all of chemistry. There are a few reasons why HF has such a bad reputation. For starters, the HF that is commonly used in industrial and laboratory settings is usually highly concentrated, 70% or greater. Concentrated HF is truly nasty stuff. It's highly corrosive and quickly destroys human tissue. It also fumes aggressively, creating clouds of dangerous vapors that are fatal if inhaled. As if that wasn't enough, HF can also absorb through the skin and flood your system with fluorine ions that upset your electrolyte imbalance and stop your heart. All in all, a pretty horrifying chemical. So why in the world would anyone in their right mind even consider using HF? Make one mistake with hydrofluoric acid and you're instantly dead, right? Well, not necessarily. Generally, the damage a chemical can do is proportional to the amount and concentration you use. In small quantities, Weaker solutions of HF are far less dangerous than concentrated HF. Several cleaning products sold directly to consumers contain small quantities of HF. 
you've probably walked right by them in grocery stores and didn't even notice. Now, just because something is sold in stores doesn't mean it's not still dangerous. It's always a good idea to do some research before handling new chemicals. Being knowledgeable about potential dangers is the first step to avoiding them. Let's see if we can do some research and shed some light on the relative danger of different concentrations of hydrofluoric acid. We'll compare three different types of HF. Concentrated, 50%. Dilute, 10%. And weak, 2%. Let's also throw in another commonly used acid, 90% sulfuric acid, as a benchmark. Just a quick note, I will add links in the video description to all of my sources I used in making this video. I encourage you to check them out for yourself. When investigating unfamiliar chemicals, the MSDS pages are usually the first place to go. MSDS stands for Materials Safety Datasheet and is a standardized format for classifying chemical hazards. Category 1 is the most dangerous, and Category 4 the least. Let's start by comparing the main hazards. Skin corrosion, eye damage, acute oral toxicity, acute inhalation toxicity, and acute dermal toxicity. First up, we have skin corrosion. Strong acids will eat through your skin and other body tissue. All three forms of HF and sulfuric acid are category one. Gloves are not optional when working with HF. Next up, we have eye damage. HF can cause severe and lasting damage if it gets into your eyes. All three forms of HF and sulfuric acid are category one. Chemical splash goggles are required when working with HF. I also wear a full face shield for additional protection. Next up, we have the three toxicity categories. Oral, inhalation, and dermal. Let's start with oral. HF is a poison, and drinking it will kill you. Concentrated HF and sulfuric acid are category one, while dilute HF and weak HF are category two. Let's look a little more closely at the numbers. Category one means that less than five milligrams of HF per kilogram of body mass will kill you. An average adult male is 90 kilograms, so that means ingesting less than half a gram of concentrated HF is lethal. Category 2 means that less than 50 milligrams per kilogram will kill you. That corresponds to a lethal dose of about 5 grams. I've seen data showing that some people have survived after accidentally drinking up to 30 milliliters of 2% HF, but that's not something you want to bank on. The TLDR is, don't drink the stuff and make sure you visibly label all containers of HF as poison. Moving on. Next up, we have inhalation toxicity. Many acids produce fumes when exposed to air. Breathing these fumes will hurt you. Concentrated HF and sulfuric acid are both category one, while dilute HF is category two and weak HF is category three. Here are some numbers. Category one means that less than 0.5 milligrams per liter of air is deadly. Category two, 2.0 milligrams per liter. Category three, 10 milligrams per liter. In my opinion though, these numbers are a little misleading. This is because they only specify how much of a chemical you can breathe before you die. What they don't specify is how easy it is to actually get that chemical into the air in the first place. Here is a graph of vapor pressure versus temperature for different concentrations of HF. There's a lot here, so let's just show the data for 50% HF and 10% HF. Much better. Vapor pressure is basically a measure of the amount of fumes an open container of acid will produce. Assuming we're at room temperature, the value for concentrated HF is about 20 millimeters of mercury, and 10% HF is off the bottom of the chart. Well, if you look at other temperature values, it's clear that the amount of vapor produced by 10% HF is at least 100 times smaller than that of 50% HF. I wasn't able to get any specific values for 2% HF, but all of the literature I read seemed to suggest that concentrations that low basically produce zero fumes at room temperature. So if we look back at our chart and reevaluate it, yes, a small amount of HF vapors are dangerous for each of the three concentrations. However, dilute and weak HF really don't produce much vapor at all, and shouldn't be a problem as long as you use small amounts with good ventilation. Given this information, I can be pretty sure that I won't be exposed to any significant HF vapors, but when the stakes are so high, I want to know what happens if I am exposed. Here's a chart showing the relative danger for different concentrations of HF fumes in the air. So anything below 0.04 ppm, and you can't smell it at all. If we go up to 0.5 ppm, that's the amount where it's recommended to use a respirator or fume hood when working with it. 3 ppm is the point at which it starts irritating your throat and lungs. 12 ppm is the amount where serious injury is possible after eight hours of exposure. 
20 ppm is the point at which OSHA requires you to immediately evacuate the area. 32 ppm is the point at which the air starts to taste sour. 50 ppm is the maximum non-lethal value. Above that, death from inhaling vapors is a possibility. 151 ppm is the RD50, meaning half of the people exposed at this level will have serious respiratory distress and possibly die. 1000 ppm is the point at which an hour of exposure will probably kill you. So this chart is nice, but what does it actually tell us? Well, my interpretation is that if you can't smell it and aren't noticing any irritation, there probably isn't a meaningful amount of HF vapor present. Still, even with low concentrations of acid, it's always a good idea to use a respirator or fume hood if one is available. Last, we have dermal toxicity. HF skin exposure introduces fluoride into your body, which can cause lethal electrolyte imbalances and can stop your heart. The dermal toxicity of concentrated HF and sulfuric acid are both one. For dilute HF, it's category two, and for weak HF, it's category three. Let's look at the numbers. Category one is less than 50 milligrams per kilogram, which means that for an average adult male, you need less than 4.5 grams to kill you. Category two is less than 200 milligrams per kilogram, so that's about 18 grams or less to kill you. Category three is 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, so that's about 90 grams or less. Now, even 90 grams is not a whole lot, but remember that this also needs to absorb into your body to kill you. So what does the data on that look like? Testing shows that the lethal amount depends on the HF concentration and the amount of skin you spill it on as a percentage of the total skin on your body. For reference, 1% of your skin is roughly the same area as your palm. So for anhydrous HF, it's pretty much guaranteed deadly if you spill it on 1% of your total skin area. And for 70% HF, it takes a bit more. For concentrations under 20%, the lethal amount drops to about 20% of your total skin area. Now, any skin exposure to HF is a bad thing, but what this data is saying is that for dilute HF, especially something like 2% HF, a small spill is exceedingly unlikely to result in a lethal electrolyte imbalance. Okay, that was a lot. So what have we learned from all this? Well, if we just look at the safety data sheets, we would come to the conclusion that concentrated HF is about the same danger level as sulfuric acid, while dilute and weak HF are less dangerous. But then why does HF have the reputation as the most dangerous acid? HF is more dangerous than other acids because of its unique ability to penetrate the skin and deliver toxic fluorine ions into your body. Unlike other acids, which damage just the affected area, hydrofluoric acid has a systemic toxicity that extends to the entire body. To make matters worse, Pain from HF burns isn't immediate, and so exposure to HF can go unnoticed and untreated for hours or even days. These two factors combined are a huge reason why even trained chemists are hesitant to work with concentrated HF. On the other hand, I think we have shown that dilute solutions of HF are not really a lethal hazard as long as the concentration is low, the volume is small, and we wear appropriate protective gear. This conclusion is supported by the fact that weak HF solutions are present in everyday products and used in the home by ordinary people. So given that HF is the only chemical I can use for etching wafers, it makes sense that the next step in the process is to find a suitable source for weak HF. There are a lot of options available, but I decided to test the following three products. The first is Winx Rust Stain Remover, which is a solution of about 2% HF. The second is Armor Etch, a glass etching cream containing chemicals that react and form HF. The third is porcelain etch, a gel used in dentistry containing 10% HF. The SDS sheets for these chemicals only specify gloves, goggles, and adequate ventilation. I also have a tube of calcium gluconate, an antidote to HF, as well as an eye wash station and a shower nearby. Let's do some science. All right, I'm gonna prep some chips with oxide layers while I explain the upcoming etch tests. So given these products all contain HF, they should all remove the oxide layer on silicon chips. What we want to do is we want to test how quickly this happens. Specifically, we'd like to be able to calculate the etch rate and also verify the uniformity of the etch. This is important for a couple of reasons. Silicon wafers naturally grow an oxide layer of about 25 nanometers when exposed to air. This layer is too thin to be visible and it must be removed before making a semiconductor device. Without knowing the approximate etch rate of our HF source, we can't know how long it will take for it to remove this layer. It's also important to know our etch rate for another reason. 
In future videos, we will be using photolithography to create a stencil that defines exactly where our oxide layer will be removed. Then, we'll immerse our chip in HF to remove the corresponding oxide layer. This photopolymer layer is resistant to HF, but it's not impervious. So we don't want to expose it to HF for longer than necessary. Knowing the exact etch rate means we can take it out as soon as possible. I'm wearing some thicker gloves because I'm about to pour out some of this liquid HF, and I'm not really sure how that's going to go. Eh, not bad. Would be nice if it had a spout, though. Because Wink Rust Remover is a liquid, it's very easy to etch the chips. All I need to do is just immerse them for the amount of time required, and rinse them when I'm done. I'm putting in a bunch of chips all at once, and taking one out every minute. The result is that I will have a set of chips with etch times of 1 minute, 2 minutes, 3 minutes, etc. That will produce a nice gradient, and it will make it easy to estimate the etch rate. Here's the first set of results. Wow. I really didn't expect it to be so slow. It barely transitioned through one color change. I used the color chart to estimate the oxide thickness, and it looks like I removed maybe 70 nanometers in 6 minutes. That's pretty slow. The etch rate is definitely less than 20 nanometers per minute, which is glacially slow, but at least the results look nice. The etch is nice and uniform, and I gotta say that the liquid HF source is definitely really easy to use. A couple of rinses and the wafers are basically clean and ready to go. Alright, next up we have the porcelain etch. This stuff is a bright green gel in a small syringe. It comes with a bunch of these tiny needles, which is definitely nice because it makes it a lot easier to dispense chemicals without the risk of splashing or using too much. The obvious downside though is that it's a lot more difficult to cover the entire chip with the stuff. Also, it's kind of expensive. I paid about $10 for this syringe, and it's probably only enough to etch a relatively small number of chips when compared to the rust remover. Still, it might be really useful for putting small, targeted holes in an oxide layer without using a mask. For this test, rather than immersing a bunch of small chips in the stuff, I'm going to just apply the gel to a small spot on the surface. I'm adding one dot of gel every minute so that I'll have five dots total with etch times of one minute, two minutes, and all the way up to five minutes. All right, time's up. Time to wash the stuff off. To get the gel off, I used a solution of sodium carbonate, which reacts with HF and produces CO2. The bubbles do a good job of dislodging the gel cleanly. After that's done, I can simply rinse the chip and I'm good to go. All right, here are the results. As expected, the 10% HF gel is much faster than the 2% HF in the rust remover. My best guess is that it's etching about 50 nanometers per minute. This is good because it means that if I use the stuff, I won't have to wait quite as long as if I had used the rust remover. I was a little bit worried because it's a stronger acid, but the syringe really makes it easy to control this stuff. I used very little, and it all went exactly where I wanted it to go. All in all, I'm pretty happy with it. Alright, the last chemical I'm going to test is Armor Etch. This stuff is a thick cream, so I'm going to apply it in dots like I did with the gel. I'm very curious to see how the Armor Etch performs, because the SDS page didn't specify the concentration of hydrofluoric acid for the product. The reason for this is that Armor Etch doesn't actually contain HF. Instead, it contains ammonium bifluoride, which reacts with the other ingredients to produce HF. Is this a cheeky way for them to avoid putting HF on their ingredients list? Maybe. At any rate, because of this subterfuge, I have no idea how strong this particular chemical is. Again, I'm adding dots of the chemical to the surface in 1 minute intervals, from 1 minutes to 7 minutes of total etch time. This stuff is a little more difficult to remove, so I ended up just scrubbing it off with a cotton swab. I also immersed the chip in sodium carbonate to neutralize any remaining acid, and rinsed it off. All right, let's see the result. What? Okay, I did not expect this. It looks like the armor etch is way faster than either the rust remover or the porcelain etch. The porcelain etch was supposed to be a 10% HF solution too, and I expected it to be the strongest and the fastest of the three, but that is clearly not the case. Well, nothing to do but run the test again with armor etch, this time, though, I'm going to apply the dots in 15-second intervals. This will hopefully give me some readable results. Okay, I've finished with the test and cleaned off the chips once again. This is a much better result. 
Hold on a second while I put together a quick graph of the data for you. Here we go. I made a graph of the oxide thickness over time for each of the three etching chemicals, and I added a best fit line for the data in order to determine the average etch rate. You can clearly see how slow the wink rust remover is, and how blazing fast the armor etches. It looks like wink is about 10 nanometers per minute, porcelain etch is about 50, and armor etch is about 240 nanometers per minute. Okay, so at this point I'm pretty satisfied with the three tests. We've confirmed that all three chemicals are valid etchants for our oxide layers, and we've gotten a pretty good idea of the etch rates as well. So what can we say about each of the three options? I think that each of the three chemicals has its own set of advantages and drawbacks. The Winx rust remover is definitely the slowest option, which means that any time I use it to make silicon devices, I'm going to be waiting around for quite a while in between etch steps. However, it's also the weakest solution, and you could argue that it's the safest option. It's also definitely the easiest to clean up. All you need to do is rinse the wafer a couple times in distilled water, and you're done. The porcelain etch is pretty nice. It's by far the easiest to apply, and you can be really precise with it if you want. It has the downside, though, of being the most expensive of the three options. You get far more for your money with the rust remover and the armor etch. I don't think I'll use this one much for entire chips, but I expect that it'll come in handy for occasional tiny fixes or adjustments. Last we have Armor Etch. This stuff is definitely going to be the most controversial option. If you want fast, then Armor Etch is the place to go. However, its high strength means that it's potentially the most dangerous of the three options, and requires the greatest care when handling it. It's also the most difficult to remove from the silicon surface, which could be a problem down the road. Still, I expect to make good use of the stuff, especially when I need to quickly chew through thick oxide layers. Wow, that was a lot of stuff to cover in one video. I feel like I learned a lot and collected some really valuable information today. Etching oxide layers is a critical part of the semiconductor fabrication process, and I think that being thorough like this will really pay off in the future. Before I go, I just want to say thank you again for watching the whole video. I know that hydrofluoric acid is a controversial topic, and I fully expect to get a lot of comments regarding concerns about safety. I'm doing my best to be safe, but I'm not a professional chemist, so if you have any feedback on this video, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. I read every single one of them. I also want to say thank you to my patrons on Patreon. Without you, these videos wouldn't be possible. I can't wait to show you what I've been working on next. See you soon.